So, um, welcome to my presentation on QEMU, uh, subtitled Virtualization for Men, though that's not what's on the conference notes, because this isn't quite PC. So this is the only place you'll see it that way. That, but that's what I meant it to be. <laughs> uh, there's some contact info for me. Um, also, uh, here is a link that at least works for the time being on um, where you can get this slide deck. It is currently up there right now, and if you just leave off the PDF part, or the resource part of the URL, just go to that address or that server, it'll also have links. Um, so, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm just some crazy sysadmin. Uh, been around a few places. Uh, I first got into sysadmin work uh, at the library at BYU. Uh, I then ended up at Mosey, and I'm now at Cluster Resources, or not Cluster Resources, dang, wow. Adaptive Computing, failed. it hasn't been Cluster Resources for years. You failed. I, I did just fail. Um, I've been using virtualization for a long time. My first uh, experience actually using virtualization was 2003, or was it 2000? I can't remember if it was before or after I went on a two-year hiatus. Um, but, I mean, way back in the day, back before most, I mean, it was before VMware was bought by EMC. So, it's been a while. Uh, I started off with using VMware. Uh, I tried Zen for a couple years, but that was back when it was still, um, it, it took a lot of munging after you got it installed to actually get things working right. Uh, it was still, you had to have a special compiled kernel uh, at the time. Luckily, they have merged that stuff in. Uh, I've tried VirtualBox, and uh, my current current uh, go-to virtualization technology is QEMU with KVM. Uh, so a little bit of overview about what we'll go through, uh, a little bit of intro on history. Um, we'll also talk about user versus system emulation. Uh, QEMU actually has two modes. A lot of people uh, kind of miss that part. Uh, then we'll talk about actually using it from the command line and uh, a few things that you can configure um, the guest or the virtual machine configuration. We'll talk about uh, how to control the hypervisor uh, and uh, some utilities and then we'll get to it, the terminal and actually go through some of this stuff and uh, hit, a, hit a console and, and uh, see what's going on. So to start off with, um, well first, uh, how many in here have used QEMU? Okay, so quite a few. More than I was expecting. Uh, so, another thing is, uh, if you've used KVM, you've used Q QEMU, uh, although I guess it is possible that you might have used KVM with just the KVM native tool, but if you're using that, you're doing it wrong according to the kernel notes. Uh, if you've used Zen in full virtualization mode, you have used bits of QEMU. And supposedly, part of VirtualBox came, came from QEMU. They, they reused some bits. But I went trying to dig through the, the VirtualBox source tree one day and couldn't find anything that I recognized. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure on that one. So let's, uh, okay, so this is from uh, the QEMU website. QEMU is a generic open source machine emulator and virtualizer. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Generic, uh, it works on multiple CPU architectures, such as ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, S390, x86, and more. Um, one kind of funny thing, last year, I had a coworker that actually needed to virtualize a IBM mainframe. <laughs> and so he was using the S390, an S390X support in QEMU to do it. And it ended up being easier than the, the uh, emulator provided by the main thing manufacturer. Go figure. Uh, open source, uh, it's mainly GPL. Uh, there are bits of it that are uh, LGPL and BSD licenses. Uh, so it's the, the core is GPL and some of the add-ons are, are other licenses. <coughs> uh, emulator, so it allows for running binaries for one CPU architecture on a different architecture. Um, so, so great for testing 
say if you're doing embedded development, great for running code for your embedded device, but on your workstation that you're actually doing the work on. Because most people aren't actually doing development on the embedded device because it's slower. And then virtualizer allows running binaries for the same CPU architecture optionally with acceleration. And there are multiple accelerators that, have, that are supported um, and they've had other ones in there. Uh, if you've ever heard of KQEMU, that was an accelerator that was available. Uh, <clears throat> so this is an example of a command line invocation that I just pulled off of a, a box that I'm administering. Um, kind of ugly, isn't it? There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, and this actually came from a, a VM managed by Libvirt. Um, I, you can ask me later my opinions on Libvirt. What is this? You just PS? It yeah, so this is the, I, I did PS grabbing for... One line. That's one line. That is one process. <laughs> yeah, it, it's gnarly. Um, it, but a lot of this stuff, if, if you're doing it yourself in the command line, a lot of this you don't have to specify. Um, Libvirt kind of takes this, you know, we're, we're going to be explicit on everything. Um, I believe there's a node desk in here which tells QVMU, don't use any of your default hardware configuration, I'm going to tell you everything. Um, it's no, no default. It's no default. Yeah, right there. That, or, and no def config. So, so with that, it has to go through and define everything. So, so like right here, you've got your USB UHCI controller defined, and um, here, this VirtIO block PCI that defines uh, the the virtual PCI device that your block device is going to be associated with, which is then defined right here. Um, you've got uh, so here's the network device along with the net dev back end, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. So if you think this is bad, this next one, the same, same virtual machine, different representation, but it takes two slides in a smaller font. This is the libvirt XML for it. It goes on to this. WTF? How am I supposed to remember this stuff? This is why I went through and figured out the command line was because I was tired of trying to figure out the XML for libvirt. <laughs> um, kind of a pain. Anyways, granted, I admit there's a lot of stuff in here to find that if you were to just go, you know, write a text file for your VM to be using libvirt, 75% of this you wouldn't have to define. It populates it if you don't put it right. It just puts whatever the default is. Yeah, is. yeah. It, I mean, it, it will define those. Um, so you, it can be easier. I just got tired of looking it up all the time, and so I, I went through and figured out how to, how to do all this stuff from the command line myself. Um, so here's a little bit of history and uh, relation of QMU to other things. Uh, it started by Fabrice Bellard. I went through the Git the current Git repo and the first commit is in 2003, um, and it looked like it was some import of some CBS stuff. So I'm not entirely sure when uh, our how, like when it was started, um, but either way, it predates KVM, VirtualBox. Um, Zen started around the 2003 timeframe as well, so I'm not quite sure which one got started first there. But um, Zen took a, a number of bits from it in 2005 for the um, Zen full virtualization support, the HVM support. Um, I'm guessing they thought writing a BIOS and low level initialization was too much of a pain, and so they'll rip it off from someone else. I don't blame them, I would too. Um, they have, so they maintained a fork of QMU for a while. Uh, the Zen support has been, I believe, mostly merged back in, if not all merged back in. Um, I don't really follow Zen anymore, so I can't say for sure on that one. Supposedly, VirtualBox ripped off some stuff in 2007. That's from Wikipedia. 
Um, like I said, I went looking through trying to find where they might have used some of that, and I couldn't really find it. It might have been just that it has morphed so much since then that it's not recognizable to me. But, yeah, take that one however you want. Um, KVM, uh, they forked QEMU to QEMU KVM when they first wrote the, the KVM module. Um, and since then, almost all of it has been merged back in. All the um, feature support is merged back in. I think um, there might be some command line arguments that, that they made, or they added to QEMU KVM that didn't get merged back into QEMU. But um, these days, it, you know, new distributions are just using upstream QEMU uh, for, for their KVM uh, support, which I think is awesome. Anyways, uh, so a little bit about uh, user versus system emulation. Uh, and I'm just, this is the only slide I have on the user stuff. Um, user emulation is a mode that will emulate a user space environment to run a, a binary uh, for either the same or different uh, architecture. So it's, uh, it will intercept and munch any system calls. Um, great for testing or for running binaries for one CPU architecture on a different one. Um, so say for example you're working on an embedded uh, system, you're doing development for an embedded system, you've compiled uh, your binary for, you know, say a MIPS architecture, that's a very common one for like uh, embedded network devices. Um, you want to just test that your, your binary runs real quick or maybe run through a, a few uh, config options with it. Um, you can use QEMU dash MIPS or whatever and then just specify your binary afterwards and it will go through and run your binary. Uh, it will, you know, translate the, the machine code, intercept system calls and whatnot so that it, it thinks that it's running on the target system but it's really just running on yours. Uh, and that, it doesn't, you don't have to boot up the whole OS for that target architecture, it just runs that one binary. Um, I believe only Linux binaries it can do this with. The Wikipedia page says that it can do Darwin and Linux binaries, but um, when I was going through a <coughs> compile from source recently, um, I didn't see any Darwin targets, I just saw Linux user targets. So um, I, I would assume Linux only at this point. Um, the other mode is system emulation, and this is, I think, what most people think of. This will uh, emulate or virtualize a full uh, hardware type, and you'll run a full operating system environment inside of it. Uh, and so this is where you, you define all the different hardware associated with your VM, uh, and actually run an operating system inside of it. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be uh, referring to for the remainder of the session. I'm also going to be assuming that you're going to be doing x86 emulation. <coughs> um, I have briefly tried other ones, but I, can't, I definitely don't have much, you know, enough expertise to talk competently on those. So um, now we'll get into to actually what you can do for configuring your, your VM. Uh, there are lots of things that you can specify. Uh, and you can specify lots of crazy things about them. Uh, these are some examples. Uh, and probably what, what are the things that you're going to be defining on almost every VM, whether you know it or not. Uh, there are other things you can do. You can do uh, PCI pass-through, or you can take a PCI device from your host and give it to your virtual machine. Um, that does require hardware support and other things, but it is possible, you, and you can define uh, other, you know, like serial configuration or sound and whatnot. So there, there's a, a wide variety of things you can configure. Um, on a lot of the devices, you'll have uh, what I call front end and the back end. Um, I, this is something I am kind of taking from the Zen world. Uh, I don't 
really see any documentation where in QMU it's referred to as a front end or back end. But the, the front end is going to be the what the guest sees, the virtual device for the guest. The back end is going to be how the hypervisor is, or how, how QMU is actually um, realizing uh, that functionality. So uh, now into some of the actual doing stuff. Uh, so you can do some crazy things with your CPU configuration. Uh, you can define your CPU type. Uh, and this, so they have a lot of, I guess you could say helper options, like Core 2 Duo here or your QME 64. Um, these are kind of like a predefined set of uh, CPU feature flags. I mean, if you ever looked in uh, proc CPU info and you see that big long list of flags, uh, like Core 2 Duo defines, okay, I'm going to present X, Y, and Z flags uh, available to the guest. Um, you can optionally use a comma separate list of additional values. Um, so, like on this invocation, uh, I'm saying add the VMX flag because QMU 64 doesn't uh, pass through guest virtualization by default. Um, and so if you have hardware support for it, you can use this to pass that through, and so then you can even do um, KVM inception. Um, you can also put a minus and remove a flag uh, as well. If you're using the KVM acceleration, there's an optional one where you can specify host, in which case it's just going to look at what your host has and pass all those through to the guest. Um, the next option for your, product, your CPU configuration is the dash SMP option, um, which uh, defines how many how many cores or, or your, your multi-processing inside of the VM. You can do, just do dash SMP2, in which case it's going to present two processors to your VM. You can also define crazy layouts in there. So for example, on this next one, uh, I'm saying Sockets two and cores two, so I get four uh, cores inside there, log logically split up between two sockets. So uh, one thing where that, this might potentially be uh, where you care about in the VM is say if you're running Windows in there, um, maybe you want to do a bunch of of cores, but Windows is licensed by sockets, and so you can you can fiddle with things there. One note on here is I have the four on the front here. That's actually not required. I discovered that late last night as I was going through and checking this to make sure I wasn't lying on something. And um, if you if these if you're defining all these and they don't multiply up to the number you specify at the beginning, if you did, it will still use the number at the beginning. So um, I would say use one or the other even though I have both on there. This could, you know, stuff I realized afterwards. Uh, next memory configuration, you're probably going to want to specify how much memory uh, your VM has. Uh, if you don't, uh, there is a default value it will use. If you're uh, on the current trunk of uh, QMU, it will use 512 megabytes. I have a question about the previous slide. Oh, okay, let me go back. Um, so you mentioned NUMA in the other one, but what about uh, CPU pinning? Can you talk about that at all here? Uh, so that isn't controlled by QMU. Oh, really? You control that uh, because each of these CPUs ends up being a thread right. on the on the QMU process, and so then you use whatever method you want uh, on in your operating system to. If you're doing this on Linux, I only do this on Linux. You use something in there to pin those threads to. To the CPU course. And I'll, I'll show you how you can find out what uh, operating system threads relate to each CPU core okay. so that you can then, if you wanted to, you can do that. Sure. Thanks. No problem. Uh, so you find an amount of memory. This is also the limit if you're going to do memory ballooning. So whatever you define here is the most that your VM can use. So you can balloon it down. You can balloon it back up, but you can't go past this. Um, at least I believe that. I mean, every time I've tried, I have not been able to go past it. Uh, 
So anyways, uh, there is a NUMA option. So you can define advanced um, memory layouts uh, also as well. I haven't done this, so if any of you guys figured out, let me know. Now into the, the really fun stuff, the, the stuff that gets kind of hairy. Uh, so for storage configuration, there, there are a ton of backing devices that you can use for QMU VMs. This isn't even a complete list, but QCOW, 2 KVHD, Ceph, NVD, iSCSI, uh, HTTP. I, I particularly love the HTTP one myself. Um, I stopped downloading ISOs for distros that I try. Um, and instead, when I launch a new VM, I'll just you know tell it to use the URL for the ISO as the CD drive. And uh, it uses libcurl underneath and will uh, just stream the bits that it needs down on the fly. So it, it's kind of cool. I, I like it. Uh, there are others on here that I don't, or others that I don't have on here as well. Um, for it, uh, I don't see anyone that was at the plug meeting a couple months ago. But uh, I think it was two months ago, Aaron uh, gave a presentation at that plug about Gluster. Uh, there's now a Gluster backend for QMU storage. So, uh, so say for, for that and RB and iSCSI and NV and whatnot, uh, what, like what Limvert will do or what many management tools will do is they'll connect that remote network storage to the, the host kernel. So on the host, you'll have like, you know, dev SDJ or something like that. And then they'll just, they'll present that to the, um, to the guest as a raw, a raw backend. With these, instead, uh, it's the, the hypervisor itself connects to those remote targets, and so you, you don't have the host kernel being involved with running the storage for the VM. So I, I, I think there's a lot of value there. Um, I brought it up at, at the when Overt launched, and I got I got slammed by everyone in the room. It was kind of disappointing. Yeah. So, so would you say that when you connecting directly to a storage backend, like let's say iSCSI for example, mm -hmm. so in what ways would the kernel not be involved? You don't have the kernel does not have a virtual block or does not have a block device on the host. Mm -hmm. So, um, what happens then is QNU is using a library called libiSCSI. It will actually connect on a socket to the iSCSI target and do all of the iSCSI protocol directly between the QMU process and the, the iSCSI target. Cool. So, which I, works pretty well. I, I've, I've done it with uh, a couple different network layouts and it's, it's gone pretty well. So I like it. Um, so anyways, that's the back end. For presenting to the guest, there again are multiple options. Um, IDE, SCSI, Vert.io, and actually now on Vert.io there's two. There's Vert.io Block, which is the, the uh, I guess you could say legacy one. Um, and now there's a new one called Vert.io SCSI, which uh, is, imagine just transporting SCSI over Vert.io. And uh, it's a lot more extensible and whatnot, and is, I think it will be the future for, for the Vert.io Block stuff. Um, down here is a few examples of uh, how to define your storage. Um, one note here is uh, the QEMU devs have said that using drive with any IF option other than none is considered deprecated. <laughs> so they, uh, this is the uh, uh, current accepted way of doing it by the devs. But these other ones still work. Uh, here's an example with iSCSI, and yes, I left out the dash bug. But it's just an example. Um, on, on this bottom one, it is you're defining a drive, and you're not defining what interface to use for the guest. Uh, here, I define a, a AHCI bus, and then I define a new device as an IDE drive associated with the AHCI bus. Anyways, and uh, so now I'm going to network configuration, and this is one that. It took me a little while to wrap my head around, and it, if you look on the QMU users mailing list, 
um, it's probably the thing that gets the most questions, is how, how the crap do I configure network? Well, there's multiple backends. Um, you can use tap device, socket, VDE. I actually kind of like VDE. Um, and then there's a slurp based backend, which uh, in QEM terms is just the user backend. Um, and so on, on all these backends, basically it's getting just Ethernet frames from the guest. And it just needs to do something with those Ethernet frames. Um, what most management systems do is they'll just create a tap device in the, on the host, connect that tap device to a, um, to a bridge, some form of a bridge, either open vSwitch or, or just the kernel bridging, and then um, connect the QEMU process to that. So any, any Ethernet frame that comes out of the guest ends up on this tap device in the host, which then the host does whatever it wants with. And a lot of the management tools actually will then also configure stuff like EV tables and IP tables to firewall that. And, and Libvirt has extensive support for that. Um, but all that stuff is happening outside of, of QEMU itself. QEMU, it really just cares about, I've got an Ethernet frame, let me pass it along to something. Um, and actually that's what the, the socket and VDE backends do. VDE is a uh, user space switch. So imagine uh, just Ethernet frames going between processes through another user space process. And I'm actually going to show that one uh, in a little bit. Hopefully we don't run out of time. Uh, there are lots of options for what you can use for the guest devices. Um, currently, if you're using Trunk, the default is an E1000 driver. Um, it used to be that the default was an RTL8139. Um, there's also PCNet, other things. Uh, VMX Net 3 is kind of a cool one that, that is, I don't know if it's been merged in yet, but there, there have been patches for it bouncing around on the uh, QMU dev mailing list. Uh, and I think the plan is to get that in sometime soon. And uh, so on that note, almost, there is support for almost all of the virtual hardware devices that VMware uses for QMU. So it's almost to the point where you, you'd be able to take just a plain BMDK for a VMware system, and no matter how you've had it configured, you can then run it with QMU without having to modify any guest configuration. So, uh, and if you're using the VMX Net free driver in your VMware VM, pretty soon you'd be able to use that VMX Net driver as well in QMU. Um, here's some examples of how you can configure it. This first one is actually what's used by default. Um, and that just says, give me one network interface uh, in the guest. That's what the, the NIC uh, option does. And then uh, dash net user says, set up a, net, a user backend. The user backend is different from the others in that it is actually running a TCP or, or an IP stack inside of the hypervisor. Um, and it's actually kind of a crappy one. It doesn't even support ICMP, so you can't ping anything. Um, but it's really easy to use and get started if all you care about is your VM being able to talk out to something. It works really well for that. Um, the other thing is, so, oh, and the, also, again, the dash net invocation is considered deprecated. Um, with the dash net one, if you def if your first keyword is NIC, it's mm -hmm. defining the hardware for the guest. Otherwise, the keyword or it's defining the configuration for your backend. Um, and you can see on this next one down, hey, we use the term VLAN, and uh, this is not 802.1Q VLANs. These are just internal to QEMU little virtual hubs. Um, so I could change, um, say this on this tap one, I can change this VLAN to one, and it would be connected to uh, this user uh, IP stack and the first network interface at the same time. Uh, any frame coming from one of those devices will get sent to all the others, um, which can be kind of cool. Um, there is a, a backend target that's dumb, which it will just take anything that it it receives and write it to a um, PCAP formatted file. 
And so you could use that to dump all the network traffic that's going to your VM and then analyze it with something like Wireshark, uh, which I've done many times. It's really cool. And uh, the only reason why this option format really still exists is because that's the only way to do it with this more advanced uh, invocation. You can't attach multiple devices easily. So this is uh, what's considered the proper way of doing it now. Um, you define a, a net dev, which is your, your back end, and then you define a device, which is your uh, network interface. And then tell your, net, your, your new network device what net dev to use. Uh, you can also uh, do some cool things with your guest console. Um, so you can have QMU present a you know virtual display device. Um, the there's a series based VMware QXL the guest display adapters, um, and then you can also have you know where that virtual display ends up uh, be multiple options as well. Uh, there are, you can do it just locally with X with either an SDL or GTK for an end. Um, the GTK one is pretty recent. Uh, I think it was added in 1.3, maybe 1.4. But you can also use a remote backend as well. So you can say start up a VNC server and uh, use it for the virtual frame buffer of the guests. Uh, there's also Spice support which is VNC on drugs, or Red Hat deciding to reinvent the wheel, however you want to take it. Um, so there's some uh, examples of how to, how to invoke it. Um, I use the VNC one a lot myself. All right, now on to hypervisor control. So this, uh, it's also called the monitor. Uh, and this is controlling aspects of the, the QME process itself and uh, what it, and control the VM as well. Uh, there's two different ways to talk to it. There's HMP with a human monitor protocol and QMU, the QAPI monitor protocol. Uh, HMP is text-based. You just give it command and options. Uh, the QMP one is uh, JSON-based and uh, works really well if you want to try to talk to the monitor programmatically. Um, Libvirt actually, by default now, uses the, the QMP uh, interface over the, the human monitor protocol. Uh, you can attach it to multiple different what's called char devs, um, which is just a, a character device. And you can use uh, standard I/O, you can use new PCY or sockets of uh, various types. Um, and there are many things you can do with it. And uh, when you're on the monitor, if you're talking to the monitor on the HMP protocol, help is great command. All right, so there's a, a few additional utilities that come with it that are really useful. Uh, QMU-IMG is a just general uh, control, uh, utility for managing virtual disks. Um, it doesn't have like a database or something like the uh, VirtualBox Virtual Disk Manager. It's, it's just worrying about files directly itself. Uh, so you can create, convert, check, resize, etc. Um, how many of you have ever had a, a virtual machine that's powered off and you need to get a file out of it? Or, or need to get a file into it? And, and how many of you have like, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and start it up, I'm going to SCP it across to something else, and then shut the VM down? If you can. Yeah, if you can. So, sometimes you can. Kind of annoying. One thing that's really cool is QEMU MBD, and this will take, it uses the QEMU block backend to then export a virtual disk as an NBD uh, target, NBD server. Um, so any um, block backend that QMU supports, you can export as an NBD target, which it also has this really cool option to, when it starts, directly connect that to a uh, NBD device on your local system. And so then you get this uh, you know, dev NBD zero or something like that, that represents the virtual disk of, uh, or that, that it lets you get at the virtual disk. Here's one caveat with them. Um, apparently, Red Hat decided NVD is deprecated, 
And if you're on EL6, including the various forms of EL6, they didn't compile NPD into the kernel. So you have to compile your own kernel to be able to get this. And they don't even include binary in the packages. So you have to recompile the community source to get it. I don't know why. I think it's an incredibly useful use case. Uh, but they think iSCSI should be used instead of NBD. You can you can get the uh, the King MBD stuff off of RFX actually. Really? Oh. Yeah. It's a pain to compile, so. Yeah, but it, so it, my thing is, is it's not included. Yeah, in the it's not. Role. And it, I I don't think it's even in the Apple repos. No, so. it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. So I mean, they they decided iSCSI is the way to go, but I know of absolutely no way from iSCSI or no iSCSI target that will let you export a QCAL or a BMDK. Right. So yeah, a, if you if you have that as a file format, there's nothing you can do to get at it. Yeah, so I start with the end. There's KeyWebBD and then there's libguestfs. I was going to say libguestfs that should do that. They take care of QCAL 2s pretty well, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, see, so they don't do everything else, <laughs> and that's it does. Don't, don't they? Don't well. I guess they can't loop back that. Yeah, li libguestfs does everything. Yeah, it handles yeah. it really well. That's yeah. What say. But there are more options that you can do with the QMB mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, now on to some demoing. To the command line. To my. All right. So, uh, <coughs> turn one. Can you guys see that, or do I need to make it larger? Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, so, just as a note here, I've set up an alias already in my system for QME64 to be um, a uh, QME binary I've compiled myself. This is a, off of Git from like three days ago. And um, I also have the enable KVM flag on there because I have KVM support. I just want to use it always. Um, and uh, let me also do this. I do have the QEMU and KVM packages installed. This is Ubuntu 13.04. If I just run this, you can see right here, KVM binary is deprecated. Please use QME system x86.64. So that's them saying, don't quit, quit using your fork. We're, we're, we're back on mainline now. So, um, and you can see here when I ran that, it just started up a, a, a window with a VM running inside of it. And as you can see, there's not much to it. Uh, this is the SDL front end as well. Um, if I run my version, this is the GTK one, which you get some menus here that let you do additional things, which are kind of cool. Um, so let's see, I need to figure out my notes just because I had a list of things to go through. So that's the uh, basic invocation. If, uh, this just started up a VM with no disks, one processor, 512 megabytes of RAM, a single network interface with the user backend. Um, so let's go ahead and kill this one. Um, if we look in this directory here, you see I got a couple of QCOWs that I have made. Um, and let me just go ahead and define the rest of the options here. So let's give uh, our VM a gigabyte over in this time. Uh, let's do socket. Actually, screw this. I'm just going to say SMB2. So I get two, two sockets with one core each. Um, uh, drive. Need to define the file for it, which we'll just do vm one I have I'm going to say it's a bird.io disk inside of the guest. Um, and I'm going to put the net nick and that user on there anyways just for the sure. So if I run this, it's going to go ahead and start running uh, a pre-created Ubuntu VM. I can log into this. Um, so yeah. We have basic network access through a, through the QMU um, IP stack, the Slurp IP stack that it's doing, and uh, so we can talk out. Uh, so let's see. Let's just go ahead and put this or uh, leave this one off to the side for a moment. Come over here to another window. Um, so I've got another VM here, 
or another virtual disk in your VM too. Let's do uh, something a little interesting with the QMUIMG command. So, so I'm going to create a new virtual disk. Uh, I'm going to define it as a QCAP2 type. I'm also going to define an additional option on here. I'm going to say that there's a backing file, actually, dash file, equals vm2.qcow. Uh, let's see, vm2. So what I did here was I just created a new QCAP that is saying, you know, that it has another backing device. So um, for any blocks that haven't been written to this QCAP yet, refer to the parent or the, the backing file, and uh, any writes just go into to, uh, this QCAP. So basically it's, you know, a, like a clone snapshot of the first one. And, uh, we take a look at the size of these, you can see that VM2 QCAP is like two something gigabytes. This, the new one I created is only 200K. So now I can start up uh, it. So we'll give this one a gigabyte of memory to. Uh, I I'm going to define a little bit more advanced. Uh, actually, I need to do something first. So this was, I just started a BDE switch, which is just a user space process acting as an Ethernet switch. So, um, so I'll define this network interface for the guest PMB LAN 1. Uh, and I'll put a user space processor or user TCP stack in it. Uh, define another network interface, uh, VLAN X2, and then do um, dash net VE sock equal temp VE.ctl VLAN equals 2. So we'll start this guy. I'll also show a little, this is something that might not work. So on this first VM that I started, first I'm going to mod probe something. Uh, this ACPI PHP module, uh, it's not PHP. It uh, uh, brings in some hot, PCI hot plug support. So now, uh, if I go over to the monitor here, uh, so uh, if you're using the uh, local graphical front ends, you can use Control Alt One Two Three Four to switch between different, uh, I guess you could say, virtual frame buffer frame buffers. So if I do Control Alt One, I see whatever the guest the guest is outputting to its virtual display. If I do Two, I get the monitor, um, and then there's by default a few others that you can also see here. Uh, three would be the the serial, first serial device, four is the first parallel device. But uh, here's the uh, monitor with the help command. You can see there are a ton of options you can do here. Um, I'm not going to get into all of them. But if I do uh, info CPUs, uh, so if I went back to what you asked about earlier, this tells what thread for QEMU is associated with each guest CPU. So you could then do uh, host pinning to control where those run. Uh, we can do info block. You can see information there. Well, it's supposed to give statistics on how many uh, writes it's done. At least it used to. Maybe not anymore. Um, but I'm going to try something crazy here. Um, I'm going to try to add a device, uh, a, a E1000 um, VLAN equals 2. So now if I do info network, 
Uh, there is now a, another E1000 device. It's not attached to a back end. If I come back to my guest and look in D message, uh, there's now some E1000 stuff. And if I do IP link list, I now have an E1. Now, uh, if I go back to the monitor here, if I do net, net, dev, oh wait a second, this might not work. This probably isn't gonna work. The net dev, you can't attach it to these virtual hubs easily. So I'm not going to be able to attach this VDE device, or attach that E1000 to a, a VDE. Um, so I'm going to have to do it this other way. <coughs> Come back over here. Now, as this thing boots up, we'll have a uh, a really we have our second interface. So let me uh, So much for live demos. <laughs> what should be happening is the two should be pinging each other now. Uh, and they would be talking across that BDE switch. So what would be happening there is the Ethernet frame is coming out of QEMU, being passed to another user space process, which acts as an Ethernet switch, uh, and then passes that frame to another QEMU process, which then hands back up to the guest. But apparently, it's not working. That works in the user. Do we need to be in system mode or for that? For the network player? I this is system mode. You said, yeah. So so even though I ran a command that's QMU64, this is an alias to the QMU system x86 64 binary. So I am running in system emulation mode. Or, or system virtualization mode. Um, so let's come back here. Uh, there are lots of other things you could do. Um, one thing that I, I did a while ago was uh, I had a bunch of VMs that were using up a ton of memory, uh, or, or where the QME process was using up a ton of memory, but the guest had freed it all, and so the guest the guest kernel was only needing like 128 meg of RAM, but the QME process was using like 8 gig uh, because uh, at one point the VM had used that much, and it was a lot on the host. But I didn't want to shut the VM down, but I want I still wanted to recover uh, the memory uh, on the host. And so I, I used the, the monitor to add a Vertio balloon device, like how, similar to how I added this E1000, and then told QMU to balloon down to, say, a half a gig, which then freed up all that memory. And then I told, the, told it to balloon back up to the max size. So that freed up all the memory on the host without having to shut down the, the VM. And, and uh, if you check out my, my Google Plus page, there's a, a post there about that. All right, so any questions, comments, compliments? I'm actually a little over time. So either I explained everything really well or I just baffled you all. Is there a difference? <laughs> my question. So <laughs> last little bit, don't use any of this. 
There's a reason why things like libvirt exist. And the, the command line options for QEV have a tendency to change. And when they do, you have to relearn this stuff. And so really, you shouldn't be doing, using it in any ways. I was, I was just going to ask, earlier you, had a, you kind of griped about libvirt a little bit. I was just curious, like, what, 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 what you don't like about libvirt. A um, couple things. Um, I think it's a little bloated. Uh, I think it makes some, I mean, there's pretty much always a libvirt running as root. I don't like things running as root that don't have to be, and, and you, you saw I ran all my VM for that. Um, and you can do just about everything without running it through now. Um, I guess you can't do PCI pass-through without it. Um, uh, I think XML is not human readable. It's just machine readable. Um, and also, because libvirt tries to be this generic thing that works with every virtualization technology, it misses out on some of the uh, cooler things that QEMU can do. For example, that VDE switch that I used, right. uh, libvirt has no support for that. You can't do it. Um, the libvirt's version of iSCSI support is let me connect the host to it. I don't think they're ever going to intend to add the just do it in the in in the, the guest process. Um, like I said, well, I went to the overt launch uh, was it a year and a half ago. And I brought that up because that, that lib iSCSI support had just been added within the, the month or two before that. And I got ganged up on by everyone in the room saying that it's a retarded idea. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, and that was like the only time that you got all of them to, to universally piss on someone. So <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> so, so if you ever hear me bash on over, that's why. Uh, so I hope that answered your question. But I guess as a follow-up, do you recommend anything other than libvirt? Like, do you have a good replacement? No, not really. That's the problem. Uh, okay. So this is why I went through and did this on myself. Um, I mean, I, I've written a few little shell scripts to, to do things for me um, that, yeah, I don't think I'd feel comfortable sharing with any glue because they're kind of <laughs> ugly. Um, but if you look on the Linux KVM.org page, they do list a lot of management tools. Not all of them are libvirt based. There are a few that are based on other things. Uh, a few people have wrote their own wrappers uh, in various languages. Those, uh, I, I briefly looked at a few of them. Some of them look like they might have potential. So I would say go look there and see if you find anything you like. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? How, did, uh, how does your experience compare, or, or was virtual box compare with the Uh So, pretty well, actually. I mean, my coworkers have probably heard me bash on VirtualBox, but uh, it actually does a pretty good job. And uh, the nice thing there is it gives you a nice graphical UI to manage all of it. Plus, it also has, you know, I mean, you can do everything <coughs> from the command line as well. Um, and a lot of the, the cool features that I like about QEMU, they, they also support for it. Uh, VirtualBox can do VE networking. It actually has support to do an ICE, to connect to an iSCSI target itself for the virtual disk uh, and a few other things. It doesn't have quite the, the rich support for backends. Like, uh, I don't think VirtualBox has support for like Ceph or uh, Gluster built in directly, so you'd have to do something on the host to get those virtual disks up. Um, but overall, it, it does pretty well, and it's free. I mean, you can't complain about free. Any other questions? All right, thanks.